Thanks for staying with us. Now, today is no time for long reads or speeches because the world as we know it has changed and only the leaders that prepare her country for the future will have a nation to govern. It's no news that Nigeria is in their need of complete leadership overhaul, especially in a time where we have a global crisis and leaders across the world have the spotlight on them. Dr. Moise Banira is a social commentator, a senior advocate of Nigeria, and a very passionate and patriotic Nigeria who has occupied various leadership roles and, has, um, and he has joined us tonight to dissect our current leadership gaps. Now remember, you can join this conversation, tweet at us at Plus TV Africa or at Way Show Africa One with the hashtag Ways, or you send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081-8038-4663. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Moise Banire. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, it's really a pleasure to have you this evening. <laughs> All right, so I think we should go straight into the conversation. Um, we've been shouting and screaming that we have a leadership deficit in Nigeria. And um, of course, I feel that the pandemic that has happened, the COVID-19 pandemic, has only come to help us to see where those gaps, you know, are. So if you were to sum up the challenges of leadership in Nigeria, how would you um, set that foundation for what the challenges are? Well, the way I was talking about it, we seem to have largely incompetent leaders, simply sit down. That is it. That's some sit up. We have so many people that are incompetent that are pretending to be our leaders today. Most of them are even dealers anyway. Okay, but Dr. Banner, in the past 59 years, we, we've been complaining about this deficiency in government. What is responsible for it? Every year, garbage in, garbage out, and it's still the same problem. So what do you think is the problem? Well, the problem is with the followership and the elites. We can divide the whole thing. Uh, before we get to leadership, today I can tell you for free that uh, in the electoral process today, you discover that most of the people that are determining who our leaders should be are usually largely the uninformed. The people that are not as exposed, that do not even know the relationship between their vote and their life, they know next to nothing. All they will tell you is that I'm voting because my, my, the person involved is from my village, the person lives in my area, he used to give me money. Uh, he attends my church, all those uh, narrow parochial interests largely inform the decision of most of these people. Those who are really elite, who are the elites, most of them, in most cases, you discover that uh, what happens is that they have this lack of static attitude to uh, election. Some of them, interestingly, even believe that their vote won't control. They don't bother themselves going out. In fact, my position is that even if you are not going to go out, you can help the system by assisting in the enlightenment and education of the masses that actually determines who becomes a leader. Because you don't blame those ones. They don't even know their difference from the, uh, their right from their left. So that's a major problem, a major vacuum. And I'm saying so without fear of contradiction that majority of them, if you do the analysis, you discover that there are people who do not even know the reason why they are voting in the first system, much less knowing the who they are voting for or the reason why they are voting for a particular person other than parochial or narrow interest or material interest. And I think that's essentially is the basis of our woes today in terms of leadership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so I hear you, sir, uh, when, you, when you said that part of the major challenges you're facing in leadership within the country in Nigeria is because of we have incompetent leaders, which is a valid argument. Now, a lot of people believe that, um, um, that this is because of excessive emphasis we place on ethnic origin. What, 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 what's your view on that? Well, in the first instance, let me say clearly and critically that I'm a very, very averse to federal character principle and the quota system. Yeah. I detest this. I condemn it continuously and consistently, and there is no basis for it. And my argument is simple. We are the origin of quota system of what you call federal character system today is from the universal state of america and it's what used to be known as reverse discrimination 
Reverse discrimination always has a terminal date. It's only in Nigeria that it is eternal now. It's eternal. It, it doesn't seem to have any terminal date. So for me, it's a very, very, very wrong thing that is promoting mediocrity in terms of meritocracy. So we must the technology join it completely. But what's the important thing that you must also take on board today and take serious note of, and when I tell people, People never think about it, but I can tell you for free that that's the reality. That today, every kindness uh, of Nigeria, in terms of leadership and governor, what you hear is that we are fighting corruption, we are fighting corruption all over the whole place. But I tell you for free, without fear of contradiction, that the price of incompetence is almost double, if not triple, that of incompetence. Mm -hmm. It's more of evil than even corruption. For me, to a certain extent, it's even better to have a corrupt person who is competent that will have a grossly incompetent person. Wow. OK, so I, I, I like um, what you have said, because I have always said, anybody that knows me knows that I've always said that education, you know, when you educate the mind of someone, I mean, there's no limit to where that person can go. And I've always seen yeah. that education has been consistently used no, okay. as a tool to impoverish the larger population. So we already know that these problems, these challenges are there. So if we were to stand up to say, you know what, we want to solve this leadership problem, for instance, as education as a tool, what should we be looking at or how do we go about this? You see, the way to go about it is very simple. And it's getting late already. I have been an advocate of the fact that we need to close the gap. How do we bridge that gap? There is a vacuum between knowledge and the actual Very voters, and we need to bridge it. How do we bridge it? It then calls in question people like you in the media, the elites, even if we are not going to vote. Now is the time that we have to engage in civic education. We need to aggressively let an average voter know the importance of his vote. Like the question I used to ask is that if somebody wants to strangle you now, you will struggle with the person in a manner, even if possible, in a violent manner to save your life. The same manner somebody must struggle over his vote hmm. because it is that vote that determines the quality of education that your child will have is that vote Healthcare. that will determine the quality of health that you will enjoy is the same thing that will be, uh, provide you with portable water other infrastructure employment and every other need of you so once you merchandise it you sell it up you consider it to be a product then that is the end of the journey so what we need to do is that we need to map our strategy towards going to the grassroots to actually educate these people on the importance of their vote so that they don't mortgage it, they don't sell it, they don't consider it as a product again, and they do not base their voting pattern on all those parochial interests of religion, ethnicity, um, tribal, and some other material consideration. You see, Major, majority of people that have eventually turned themselves into scavengers. And one other area that you need to work on seriously, which I tell people, and we have never paid attention, i give you an example, is the market, the marketplaces. If you go to an average market today during any election, the people there, most, the old women largely, and even some of the men that I they will always sleep overnight in those markets for the purpose of voting for a particular party, particularly the party in government. And how is that so? They will tell you that, ah, if you don't sleep over and if you don't vote for their party, they will shut their market the next day and we won't have means of livelihood again. Please let us stay there and do what they want because they are vulnerable. They take advantage of that. They exploit them. Nobody comes to their assistance. Nobody protects their interest. Nobody defends them. And the sad thing is that in some instances, some of these women die in the process. By the time they expose themselves to the cold of the overnight or the infection of the, uh, of the flies or mosquitoes overnight, they develop malaria or other ailments. Nobody comes to their assistance before you know it, they die off. And that's the end of the road. And nobody is still there for them. So we need movement that will be able to defend the vulnerables against the imposition or the sapping of their will, their free will in the election of their own candidate. And secondly, we need to also educate all others, including them, on why they must base their uh, vote on certain parameters that you need to explain to them. Who is this person that you want to vote for? What has he achieved in his, plan, in his life? Has he run anything successfully in his life? Does he even have a job? 
Is it exposed? Is it computed? Is it educated? Those are the issues. In fact, part of our job, our assignment, is that we must have movement also that will define the parameter. For example, there is this, uh, an informal movement that is already dialoguing over some issues that the regional assembly raised recently that we know that might not be denied everything, for example, in terms of educational qualification. But it goes beyond the educational qualification. There are so many funny degrees all over the old place today that you can read. You can see some people with PhD that cannot be even communicate in one sentence. Hmm. So it goes beyond just mere paper qualification. So those are the ways to do. We have a lot of work to do in terms of education and enlightenment of the masses. Of the Okay, Dr. Banira, part of the problems we have in Nigeria is weak institutions. Our public sector is weak. And it is directly connected to service delivery, the healthcare sector, the educational sector, the police force. Nobody's paying attention. How do we strengthen our public institutions? And so the problem we have is that in Nigeria, the, let me tell you the, first, the weakness before you get to the institution. What is institution? What is responsible for institution? How do you have institution? That is the best rock. What informs what an institution is? Is the rule of law. Is the rule of law. Do we have rule of law? Is the first fundamental thing you must address. When you have a rule of law, then you don't have a problem with the institution. A institution will become strengthened eventually. But where you do not obey the rule of law, and I will explain to you in a short while, then we have a problem. And I will explain it. For example, the Police Act. Ah. <laughs> For example, the Police Act, or any of the other agency, let's say NDDC, for example, now they have their act establishing them. EFCC has its own act. The ICPC has its own act. These are laws establishing them and giving them their powers. Even at times guaranteeing the tenor, the tenor of the order of the office to say this man after going through screening and being sworn in is guaranteed a tenor of five years but what will you find out at that time if the man attempts to do the writing in one or two years they put him out mm. without reference to the rule of law that guarantees his tenor and all of us keep quiet there and go to rest and that is the beginning that's how we have weakened all our institutions today all institutions are created by law institutions must function in accordance with their law that is the basic thing they need to function in accordance with their law. For example, I was telling somebody during the, uh, the, 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 the uh, screening of the chairman of the chairman of EFCC that people were complaining that, that look, why should the SSI take report to the Senate directly? Are they not part of the executive? And I started laughing. I said, ah, you see, now this is part of the ignorance. DSS is established, is an, uh, is an agency established by the law. Now, the DHS can even write a report indicting even the president himself. That's how it's functioned all over the whole world. It's only in Nigeria that these are not done right. It is an independent agent that has his own briefs to deliver. So, but here, yeah, because we do not obey the rule of law, that is why our institution continues to get weakened and if not non existent again. So, for me, what we need to work on is the rule of law. If you are able to strengthen the rule of law, you will have strong institution as against strong individuals. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I completely agree with you about strengthening the rule of law because we see that a lot of our leaders have poor regard for the rule of law. Talk about uh, the Ojis or Kalu case, for instance, and also the burial of uh, the late chief of staff, Abba Kiari, where obviously every leadership, everybody in leadership there flouted the social distancing rules. Now, as citizens, what is, because there is the office of the citizen, sadly a lot of Nigerians are not aware of this, what do we do to make our society better? Not forgetting that these leaders we produce are from amongst us. Absolutely. So how do we bring about this change while occupying the office of the citizen? There are so many ways to do it. The most potent one is to effect change of leadership and put in place during any election a credible leadership. That is the fundamental one. The other one, at that, people say civil obedience by way of protest. So say this one, we will not agree on this one. And you are all united. And say, no, we will not take this one. This is not proper. In other civilized jurisdictions, we follow 
you discover that there's a limit to where their leaders can uh, can go because they know the citizen will naturally react. But here yeah, we are too docile. Mm, we are totally docile and passive in our affairs. And we tend to forget every day uh, what uh, I think it was John, uh, John Stuart Mill that says so, that all it takes for a nation to decay is for the good people there to keep quiet. Mm, once, yes. What happens to an average Nigeria is that once something does not directly affect him, he ignores. Not until the day, he now becomes a victim, starts shouting. When it happens to the first level, you keep quiet, you won't talk. What else, you should talk from the beginning because they called the first person said you didn't talk. They, they, they called another person like you didn't talk. The day they will use you to uh, make pepper soup, that is the day now the people will say you will expect people to jump up. And that is the problem. There must be a, an aggregation of position by the citizen and they must be able to speak out particularly on what is right and wrong. However, let me also ship in quickly that one other fundamental problem we have in this country is that there is no sense of right, national sense of what is right and wrong. Hmm. If a citizen is right, somebody somewhere will tell you, no, who told you is wrong? It's right. Hmm. So we don't have the minimum content in terms of national ethics. Some people will do certain things, they tell you, ah, is it, it's politics, what do you mean? It's, well, the man is playing politics, while well, the man is lying. Hmm. If the man is lying, we see people are proud, and see the way people are resigning. Small things like this, the man will resign. But here, everything goes. Everything goes. So for me, the citizens need to know that they have a right to react in terms of policies and other directions that are given by government in a very lawful manner. You can even challenge such actions in court. And people do challenge them in court. And that is one of the ways to go. And it gets to a level that people even go by way of civil uh, I mean, uh, protests. So these are some of the ways, but I think that it's likely a function of education. People don't know what their rights are, and they don't know where they have wronged them. Hmm. Which is still, which, which, which still brings it back to why the I said that I think education has been a tool in the hands of our leaders to continue to, to, to keep us small. But you see, what Lamy said about strengthening the institution, for instance, if I get a case, I, I mean, yesterday night I was harassed by the police. That was why I chuckled when you mentioned the police force. I was harassed by the police and, you know, I mean, when I spoke up, it was as if I was the one at fault the because I was speaking up, you know. Uh, people are quick to say, ah, calm down or be quiet. If we all are quiet, then how do we even change the system? If we say, don't say anything. My mother calls me up and says, uh, oh, please don't say anything. I said, mommy, if we keep on keeping quiet, when can we change this thing? Nobody's ready to die. That's what they keep saying, that you cannot die for the country because if you die, it, it's insignificant. And we have allowed this decay to happen and it has really, really eaten deep. So how do we even start? Because the, you know, the, I just to you what just I may said, that all it takes for a nation to decay is for the good people there to keep quiet. Yeah. We must not keep quiet. We must not get discouraged and frustrated. You see, to effect change in, in any society, you do not need the majority. Hmm. You need some interesting figures such as 5-10% of the people who will take out the responsibility towards educating the others. <clears throat> Particularly in an environment such as ours, like you rightly said, where we need to seriously educate and enlighten people. But that is not the only tool of uh, oppression. Hmm. There is another tool of deprivation, that is hunger, poverty. Hmm. That's another deliberate one. They keep majority of these people in abject poverty so that they can reason. Absolutely. That's so bastardized that they don't even know their sense of right and wrong again. So we are going to be fighting two battles, that of poverty, and that of our education. Okay, all right. So, Dr. Banire, please, we'll, we want to take a quick break. Um, just stay with us. We'll be right back.